Hello Internet, I'm Guy. This is my mini lathe. I bought this about a year ago. Uh, I bought the most ex inexpensive mini lathe I could find. I think I spent about $460, not including shipping. And when I got it, I spent an entire week trying to dial it in and get it um, aligned and tuned up and working better. It was, it was actually in really bad shape when I got it. In fact, one of the wheels here was so badly out of the line that it would stick. Um, so I really enjoyed that process, actually. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it differently. I don't think I'd spend money on a more expensive machine because I now know every single part of this machine. I stripped it down, uh, tightened everything up, uh, dialed in the ways, everything. So um, I know my machine really well. I think that's a real advantage. And so if you're shopping for a mini lathe, I would seriously consider buying low and learning how to fix it as you go. It's a real valuable lesson. You can also spend a lot of money if you have it and it's a disposable income and get a machine that will right out of the box be fairly good. Um, I'm not saying that you won't need to dial in your machine a little bit once you get it, but you certainly can start a little higher up. I chose to start at the low end. Um, and then I added a lot of things to this machine. So I'm going to go over this uh, in a lot of detail, all the funny little things that I've added and learned, um, and let's just dive right in. I'll start, uh, let's see, where shall I start? Quick change post. Let's jump in there. This is one of the first best improvements you can do to your mini lathe, is to put a quick change post on here. The way it works is you have um, replaceable inserts that you can drop onto it, like that, and lock it in. So this dovetail closes down, as you can see here. It comes down and grips laterally here and grabs this this way. There are others where a button pushes out this way to hold it, and that can then push this out a little bit, which I don't like. I, I prefer this design. Uh, they're relatively affordable. Um, I bought a whole bunch of these tool holders, and of course then you can put in different tools as you choose. So um, I have a whole collection of them that I'll show you in a moment. Another small improvement I made was to put a thrust bearing beneath this nut that tightens the tool post down. You're often adjusting the angle of the tool post and repositioning it like that. And so every time you're moving this nut back and forth, it would start chewing into the aluminum or metal on here. I'm not sure what kind of metal it is. But this is a, uh, a needle bearing type thrust bearing. So it comes with two precision washers. Get that off of there. There we go. So you can see the needle bearings right there and a, and a washer that comes with it. And then that, that makes this whole force transfer much more easily too. So it actually just makes the tightening process a little more easy to do. Another improvement I made was to install a tachometer here, which comes on the moment I start the machine. I also put a red light on here that comes on when the machine's running, just to make sure that I can see that it is on, because you can start the machine, but if you set the speed so low, you don't know it's actually turned on. Um, so you can turn it up like that. Let me just show you how this was installed. Um, there's a sensor here that comes with the kit. This is a very inexpensive kit right here. And you mount a magnet somewhere on your rotating part. I glued this on with crazy glue. It's just fine. Um, thickened crazy glue and it's really bonded on there very well. But it has to be close enough that it can see that as it goes by. Uh, if I turn this all the way off, let me just show you something here. You can see this light here on the end and you can see that it blinks very slightly every time this goes by. So let me leave that running so I can see it going. Um, so this is powered from a small wall wart, a little wall plug-in power supply that I tucked in down at the bottom of the control box here. There's quite a bit of room down in there. Um, let me point, point right down in, in this area right here. So there, there's the drive circuitry right here, but then behind it, uh, there's a place where I could put a little wall power module that's just tucked in there. And whenever this switch is pressed, it turns on the AC power to the whole machine and to the uh, tachometer. Something I built fairly early on is this chip capture that is a magnetic. So it comes off, this is made of polycarbonate, so it's unbreakable. It has three magnets embedded inside here. So you can see them right in here. They're glued in with crazy glue. So they're actually right to this surface and also right to the edge surface. So that when I attach it, it goes up against the tool rest there. Um, and of course it moves around with everything. You can also reposition it, and sometimes I will put it up this way, so it'll sit right there and catch chips that way. Um, there are various designs for this, and uh, some people install bellows all the way across here. I didn't particularly like that. Uh, it doesn't fit well with my particular machine. 
Another thing I did was make a uh, carriage stop here so that I don't accidentally bump into the jaws when I'm machining. So I can m simply set this with um, either this position here or I can move the little rod in and out and make it so that it bumps right into the carriage here and stops it. Another really inexpensive add-on is this gooseneck light that attaches magnetically and has its own little switch and it runs on a small power module. Um, the magnet is really, really strong, so it just hangs on there really beautifully. I mean, it, you have to fight to take it off, so it, it just sticks. And uh, this is really nicely repositionable. You can put it just about anywhere you want. Uh, it's really helpful to be able to see up close on small parts like this one I'm working on here with just a, a little knurled knob for a project I'm working on. Another add-on is this digital position readout, uh, or DRO, which is uh, for the carriage. So as I move the carriage, it gives you either absolute or relative positions. I can zero it at any point here, and it'll go to relative positioning, or I can go back to absolute positioning so I know how far I am out from the beginning here. So here's the back view of the machine. Here's the linear scale and the sensor head. I simply used a piece of bent sheet metal to uh, secure it to the carriage here and uh, to the sensor head. It's important to get this aligned perfectly so that it doesn't drift off and give you erroneous readings. And here's the sensor here, right, wired to that sensor. Um, this is the display, rather. Another thing that I made is a carriage lock. Here's the locking handle for it, and I'll explain that in a moment. But if you try and just use the uh, locking nut on the drive screw, the lead screw, lock that down, um, you've still got some wiggle room here, and that's unacceptable. So you can't really use that for accuracy. So if I unlock that, and then I just shift this over like that, that actually locks this. Oh, it didn't grab right. Yeah, there we go. All right, now it's grabbed. So that, that is absolutely immovable. Um, the way I made this is there's a plate that goes all the way across here that is threaded, and then, of course, a cap screw is buried down into there. Um, this is removable because you want to be able to cross-slide to move past this if you need to. So this is just a, a modified Allen wrench that I put a handle onto it, basically, with some uh, plier handle dip. And actually, I, I machined an aluminum rod to go over this, or a tube to go over it. But then I put some plastic dip on there to make it more amenable and easier to see, so it's red. Possibly the most valuable add-on I put on this machine is these digital readouts that I have on both the cross slide locations and on the tailstock, which I'll show you shortly. Um, it's really helpful to know exactly where you are, and of course you can zero wherever you want to be at any time, and uh, you can change from millimeters to inches if you're one of those European types. Very helpful. I use them constantly for dialing in you know, surfacing, diameters of rods, all that kind of stuff. Uh, these came from Little Machine Shop, which are basically my drug dealer. I love everything that they make, and I've bought a lot of stuff from those guys, so I'll give you a link below to them if you haven't found them already. If you have a, a small machine, either a lathe or a mill, you need to know about Little Machine Shop for sure. This is the digital readout on the tailstock. You notice that I've mounted it at an angle here because it's just easier to see. When it was originally uh, horizontal like that, I really couldn't see it uh, while I was working, so I twisted it around a little bit. It works great. Um, one of the nice things about all these DROs is they measure the actual position of what's moving. So in this case, the quill on the cross slides, it's the, the cross slide tables. Um, but, you know, no matter how much slop you may have in your system, it doesn't matter. It will accommodate for that because it's measuring this and not your hand wheel position. Another thing that I did as one of my first machining projects was to improve the handles here because these were not, they had no swivel on them originally. It was just a bolted on part here. It was kind of cute, but kind of useless because you want to be able to turn it without it sliding around in your hands. So this is just a piece of aluminum rod and a cap head screw that goes in here. Same thing here. Very easy to make, a, a great first lathe project. Another improvement that I uh, have put on this machine, I got the idea from another YouTuber, is to use a baking tray as a chip catcher. You can just take this out and dump it whenever you want to. Um, I removed the underneath uh, plate that was underneath the machine and also the back plate that was uh, back there, this, the back splash catcher, and I've mounted it to these large aluminum plates here to stabilize it so that the bed can't twist from one end to the other here. Um, it's mounted to a riser on my rolling tool cart, and I'll show you that in a second. I have the whole machine mounted to the top of a rolling tool chest 
with a uh, box that I built out of half inch MDF and uh, three quarter inch MDF at the top and bottom. And then I have in my drawers down here all of the parts I need for the machine. So let's take a look at some of those. In my top drawer here I have most of the tools that I use most often. So I'm starting on the left. Uh, boring bar tools and the quick change boring holder, boring tool holder. I have a couple of uh, cutoff tools. I have a large uh, heavy duty one and a small slim one. A uh, whole bunch of other different cutting heads. Uh, this is the knurling tool which I'll talk about later. Uh, call it chuck for the head and also a four jaw independent jaw uh, for the head. Uh, live center, drill chuck, and then this is a little mod tool that I put on a live center that is a, a cylinder cone here so you can center um, cylindrical items on the tool stock without having to drill a hole for the live center to go into. So this allows you to center up stock and not uh, damage it in the process. You don't have to make a relief hole for the center uh, follower to go into. This I built, um, this is one of my first lathe projects too. This is a die follower, so you put a die in there for threading and you can ride it onto the uh, male thread that your male rod that you may want to thread on the, uh, the head. These are the extra jaws for my standard three jaw chuck. Uh, so these are the outside grippers rather than the inside grippers. This is a cool tool I don't use very often, but it's a center finder or a center punch for anything cylindrical. So you set this on your cylinder and then punch it in like that. Pretty cool tool. And this is the knurling tool, which I'll get into in a moment. Then I keep a few, uh, like a little small square here, file brush, some brushes, files, uh, replacement batteries for the DROs, and uh, a couple of wrenches. In my second drawer, I keep a bunch of metal stock. Um, so I have aluminum, steel, Delrin in black and white, brass, aluminum, small aluminum, and some odd pieces like this. Uh, some really neat tubes that I've been messing around with and making fun things out of. And a little collection of very small pieces of brass and copper that I got on uh, eBay somewhere, I think. I also have some uh, bits of clear acrylic, too, that I like to pull around with. So this is a good place to keep all my small stock. In the third drawer here, um, I have tools that I don't use very often. So I have a metric set of drills, a whole bunch of cap screws. These are all the parts that came with the lathe that I removed when I did upgrades. I have an old drill set that uh, I probably should throw away. And silver and Deming drill bits. So these go from 9 sixteenths all the way up to 1 inch. I think this would seriously strain this machine. I haven't tried it yet. But it's nice to have big drill bits to save all that boring work. This is the old tool post head, by the way, which I'm probably going to scrap for parts. Earlier I mentioned the carriage lock that I put in over here, so that locks it really nicely. But I also had a problem here where the cross slide had a bit of travel. It would move just a little bit, you can hear it. So I put this locking nut right here. It's a very simple thing to make, and here's uh, the first attempt that I made out of steel. Um, it's a 632 thread with a knurled head on it. I, I love that knurling tool. It's a really nice tool. On each side of the riser that I built for my tool chest, I have these um, shelves on the side that actually fold down if I need them to. These hold all my go-to tools, you know, the chuck key, little scale ruler here, uh, calculator, and metric set of wrenches that uh, fit the machine. And on the left, similarly, I have a fold-down shelf that can fold down easily and fold it out of the way snaps into place and this is my chuck key and my most used wrench for tightening the tool holder post. This is the knurling tool that I have attached into a quick change adapter. Um, the way this works is you get it into position like this, center it up over the material you want to turn. So I'm just moving it laterally to get it centered and then it's loose right now. You can see that it can move a little bit like that. So when you turn this knob they both grip down onto the material. So you just turn it down like that, get the machine running really slowly. Make sure there's plenty of oil and then just start bearing down with this knob until you get a nice knurl. It's usually a good idea to stop and check to see if it is knurling well, which it is. It's creating some nice diamonds. So I'm going to continue and just knurl a little bit more. This is purely demonstration. I'm not going to use this but as you can see, the machine is bearing down, loading down quite a bit. And I'm tightening it down pretty hard. 
I should probably add some more lube here, but it's, it's holding up pretty well. There we are. So that should be sufficient right there. And let me just remove that out. You should lock the carriage, by the way, whenever you're using a tool like this so it doesn't wander on you. On this particular machine, which I believe is a standard C3 machine, uh, the direction of the lead screw that drives the carriage is changed by this lever here. So you pull it out, drop it down there for reverse, pull it out again, drop it back in here for neutral, as in non-driven, and then this is forward, as in moving the head this way. Um, I found that there was no locking hole or detent in there for this pin to drop into, and there really isn't that much movement. So I drilled a, a hole there and made a detent so it positively locks into neutral, because then it, it, originally there was kind of a flat surface there and it could accidentally drift down into the wrong location, and that would be really bad. I find this really quite charming, actually. Here's some of the first projects that I made. I got interested in making small containers with very precise fit lids that are an interference fit so that they pop when the lid comes off. Uh, these are relatively small as you can see from the ruler there. And then my ex-wife who has Parkinson's disease wanted to have a way to carry pills with her in a purse. So I made this out of Delrin. It looks like a giant pill of course. A recent project involved turning a large 4-inch diameter cylinder for the base of an art clock. This is one of a series of clocks that I've been making over the last few years, and you can see them on my YouTube channel. Here's what it looks like, and it's currently showing the time in hours, one hour per dot. I hope you found some helpful ideas here. Uh, let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and I will put lots of links down below on all of the details of what I've talked about today. Have fun machining!